And today we say enough, enough colonization, enough occupation, enough apartheid, enough of this siege. And today we say in one voice, stop this genocide. The people of Gaza are broadcasting it live and the Israeli soldiers themselves are showing us what they're doing. They told us what they will do and they're showing it to the world. I think everyone realizes now that the system of apartheid that Israel has created is not sustainable. So where does that leave us? Peace be upon you and welcome to episode 5 of Let's Review. And today we are featuring a voice which I felt was underrepresented in our podcast. Whilst we've spoken to the Jewish voices, we've spoken to journalists. We had not yet spoken to a Christian voice. We had obviously some imams representing the Muslim voice as well. And who better to speak to than someone who is from the town where it is said that Jesus, peace be upon him, was born, Bethlehem. And this individual is someone you would have seen across the media, especially in recent times, but even before. He represents, as a pastor and reverend, the Christmas Evangelical Lutheran Church. He's also a director of uh, Christ at the Checkpoint Conference, and he teaches at the Bethlehem Bible College, a very renowned and well-known pastor who we are, who's joining us today, and I'm very delighted to join us today, Dr. Munter Ishaq. Dr. Munter Ishaq, peace be upon you, and thank you so much for giving us time in your busy schedule to join us today. But Dr. Rivlin, my, my first question is in relation to, obviously, what's happening in Palestine. And you have spoken out so bravely from the very beginning about the oppression of what is occurring with the people of Gaza. And of course, it's not just Muslims, it's also Christians who are suffering from this. My first question is, that why do we see this apparent disparity, you yourself being in Bethlehem, Palestinian uh, Christian, who are speaking out and saying that this is a genocide, you have said on record, you have said that this, they are being racist, you have said that what they are doing is simply oppression. There are people also in other countries who are evangelical Christians or Christian Zionists who are saying the complete opposite they are saying that what's happening is actually the right of the Israelis to defend themselves. They are quoting biblical literature to say that what is their right to be in this land and to defend themselves. So how could it be that you, you're both following the same Bible, you're both Christians, but there's such a huge dis different disparity. Can you explain this for the sake of the viewers who may not be familiar with this? Yeah, um, if it only was a matter of what holy texts say, uh, because... We all know that many times we bring our own background interpretation and worldview into the text and maybe even make the text say uh, what it wants. Uh, I bring the perspective of living on the ground. I'm a Palestinian, I'm a Palestinian Christian. Uh, this is my land, this is my history. Uh, I lived through the different periods. Uh, I lived through the first and second intifadas. I'm, I'm experiencing this war right now firsthand, maybe not in Gaza, but here at the West Bank. Uh, and uh, to us, we look at this as a matter of, uh, you know, not we don't interpret from distance, but we talk about issues from our lens relating to justice, uh, relating to facts on the ground. Uh, and many times, many Christians who hold different views and come and visit us, they actually have no idea what's happening. And they tell us if we only knew, uh, because they just assume things and read things through their own lens between how uh, the Western world views us uh, and views the Orient in general, uh, many times with condescension, with superiority. And we forget that at the end of the day, many of those evangelical Christians come from the uh, United States, which have strong economic and political ties with Israel, and Israel serves the uh, uh, interest of the United States. If it only were a matter of what the Bible says, I don't think we'll have a problem because it's deeper than that. It's it's a political imperial relationship. And at the same time, uh, I truly believe that racism is involved. The only way to interpret not just the silence and complicity, but the support of some Christians uh, and I'm being very general because there are many Christians who actually stand with Palestinians, stand with justice, stand with peace. Uh, but the support uh, to this genocide convinced me and many others that many in the Western world do not look at us as equals, whether the governments or 
in some uh, French cases, church leaders. Uh, how else do you continue to justify and rationalize and explain and defend the killing of 13,000 children? And the total number is 30,000 Palestinians, not counting those under uh, uh, under the rubble. Uh, no, uh, yeah. Sorry, please go ahead. Uh, I was going to ask you, you mentioned this a few times about, I've seen some of your lectures where you said maybe because we are not white or because maybe we are of a different color. This war has confirmed to us that the world does not see us as equal. Maybe it's the color of our skins. Uh, what exactly do you mean by this? Are you saying that if you were, and this goes into the depiction of Jesus, peace be upon him, in other places, blue-eyed and etc. But uh, what, what do you mean by this exactly? Uh, that you you uh, it's it's a uh, it's a type of racism. How do you how do you prove this? Well, I, I, I say this because we looked at how the world reacted to Russia and Ukraine and to uh, uh, Russia cutting water and electricity uh, and preventing food from Ukraine, as opposed to how they reacted to the same exact things happening to Palestinians in Gaza. Uh, that in itself is enough to tell you that they don't see us as equals. You know, they lament the killing of Israeli Jews and, you know, I'm against the killing of anybody, especially children and innocent people. We don't see people uh, sympathizing with the killing of Palestinians. And even when you think that they would sympathize with us as Palestinian Christians, we only to discover that our positions are always dismissed. They don't take us seriously. Uh, and they're just comfortable with some words of sympathy uh, and, and charity. This is why I've been, you know, I said, you know, the Western world is so good in lecturing us about the human rights and about equality and international law. But when it comes to Palestinians, they always turn a blind eye to the abuses of Palestinians, to the mistreatment of Palestinians, and to Israel breaking the international law over and over again. Israel is committing obvious war crimes as we speak uh, that don't need any debate or deliberation. Uh, yet the world continues to turn a blind eye. United States you know, veto the uh, resolutions for ceasefire, saying, you know, we must reach better conclusions, better understandings, and so on. Meanwhile, Palestinians are being massacred on a daily basis. Um, so for the sake of being diplomatically right or saying the right things and defending their interests, they are sacrificing Palestinians uh, and Palestinian Christians because we are uh, uh, among the main victims of uh, the occupation of Palestine and the colonization of our land. Uh, the Christian presence right now is in serious danger of disappearing uh, because, and you know, since the creation of the state of Israel. What, what do you mean by this, that the <clears throat> Christian population, because uh, it's in serious decline, in, in what sense do you mean, uh, Reverend? So at the beginning of the 20th century, we were almost 12% of the population. Right now, we're less than 2%. Uh, Palestinian Christians continue to immigrate or in some cases be forcibly displaced from uh, this land. Uh, let us not forget that when Israel was created, it was created on uh, the ruins and towns of almost 500 Palestinian towns and villages. Some of them are, uh, you know, uh, Christian villages and towns. Uh, tens of thousands of Palestinian Christians became refugees in 1948 and are still denied the right to return to their homeland. Uh, many Palestinian, like many Palestinian Christians, like many Palestinians, uh, are still denied the right to come and live in their land because when Israel became the occupying power, whether in 1967 in the West Bank and Gaza, uh, or even when Israel was created in 1948, if you were physically outside of the land, you lost your right to return and live in your land. So Israel has created the system uh, in which there is definitely uh, privileges to any Jewish person around the world over against the indigenous people of the land, including the Palestinian Christians. And Israeli policies on the ground make life very, very difficult here. Uh, and we're seeing one family after the other opt to leave, immigrate, and seek a better future for their children. Uh, and uh, this is why right now our numbers are uh, very small, very little in the, in the country. 
in, in, the, in the place where it all started. I mean, you, you would think the Western world will be eager to prevent that, uh, but they're not, they're not. And uh, they know that, and we, we always say, there is no Christian solution. In other words, you, you, you can't solve the conflict for Christians. You can't create something, uh, a, a reality in which Christians will stay. Uh, what you have to do is solve the conflict, is end the occupation, is end the system of apartheid, that only then we are able to stay and, and, and survive and thrive in this land. How, how um, I, two questions. One is, you're talking about the solution. We'll come to that at the end. But also, <clears throat> you've been visiting many countries you, recently in the United Kingdom, um, and you had many sp- talks, etc. How is your message being received by all people, Christians or otherwise? Are people listening to all the things that you are saying? You've been speaking out for so long, and people like yourself. Is it having any effect? And uh, when you came here recently, you've I think you spoke out about how the fact that there are some and it's the same again from other places. If you, I have to say, from the if you look at many of the Muslim leaders today, they can do a lot more, but they're not doing anything. Many of the Arab countries have a lot of power to unite and put pressure, but they're not. So we have to be fair. But you also called out some of the Christian leaders in the West, who sometimes don't have the backbone to stand up, and they're being diplomatic. So how was your experience coming here, trying to meet the Archbishop? It's been prominent in the news. He didn't. He refused to meet you. Now he's going to meet you. Can you describe this a little bit in your own words? Well, when I speak against church leaders, I'm not singling some church leaders out. It's that I'm a Christian and I I don't want to go lecture other faiths before looking to my own community. And uh, many are resonating with my message and not just my message, the message that's coming from many leaders on the ground here in Palestine. Uh, The problem is that many times church leaders and uh, decision makers uh, don't use the leverage they have and the power they have uh, for political pressure. Uh, they're hesitant, they're afraid. Uh, they're trying to be neutral uh, in a time when neutrality only enables more killings. Uh, they're trying to be balanced in a time when, you know, we're investing time trying to try to please everybody, uh, whereas what needs to happen is to defend the oppressed and speak truth uh, to power and call things by their name. Uh, I think when I come and travel, I, I see a common thing, which is there is this growing gap between many on the ground. Look at the streets, look at the demonstration in London that I uh, took part in. There was close to 200, 250,000 people. Yet the parliament was still uh, deliberating over uh, technicalities, uh, uh, whether they should vote for a ceasefire uh, or not. And I think I see the same in churches because I, I, I receive a lot of positive response, uh, whether on social media or via email or when I was in London. Uh, yet it seems that the leaders themselves, as you said, sometimes, you know, the thing I said is what we need more than anything right now is courage. Uh, it's not as if we need to expose reality on the ground, as if, you know, nobody will be really shocked uh, after the genocide is over. Uh, I think if if we will be shocked, we will be shocked by the magnitude, but we already know it's hell on earth. We already know that tens of thousands have been killed. We already know that there are thousands under the rubble. We already know that 85% of uh, Gaza people have been displaced. We already know that at least 60% of the infrastructure is destroyed. The people of Gaza are broadcasting it live and the Israeli soldiers themselves are showing us what they're doing. They told us what they will do, and they're showing it to the world. So it's not a matter if we only knew, but it's a matter of having the courage to say, no, enough, we will not allow this, and to put pressure on uh, politicians uh, to speak out. Um, at the end of the day, you know, it it's painful to admit, but politics is... What politics lacks today is is morality and integrity. What do you think, uh, Doctor Munter? Like sometimes in any for many, it doesn't matter what the faith is. But when you if you're giving your message, some people almost feel like they're paralyzed to express their opinion or support the Palestinians. Why do you feel this is the case amongst so many people, especially in the West, where when you like you said, apparently it should be very obvious this 
facts and figures are out there. There should not be a. I, I've heard you say many times there should not be a debate or deliberation, but there is a debate and deliberation. There is people saying very passionately, and somehow they believe it that actually it's a right of self-defense. Actually, what's happening is fine. Actually, what's happening is according to religious scriptures of any type. It could be Jewish scripture or Christian scripture or whatever it might be. Why do you feel people have that almost sense of being paralyzed to express the truth when it's seemingly obvious as you're saying? Um, paralyzed gives the impression that it's beyond their power. I think many times they choose not to speak the truth. Uh, we have to be honest and we have to challenge them because uh, they choose to stay comfortable in some cases. Uh, they choose comfort uh, because they don't want to get into controversial issues. Uh, in the West, they are still paralyzed by uh, guilt from uh, their history of anti-Semitism. And I understand that, but that doesn't, you know, you don't deal with anti-Semitism by supporting Zionism, which has become, an, you know, a system of apartheid, of exclusivity. It's, it's beyond my belief how the West uh, dealt with their problem of anti-Semitism by supporting Zionism. Uh, and in many times, it's a decision they make because of political interest, because of, you know, uh, this whole, you know, this whole Judeo-Christian tradition or, uh, you know, uh, American nationalism that so much embedded in it is support to Israel. You know, they choose to say Israel is always right. Uh, and that's why I continue saying, don't convince me it's not racism, because they continue to insist Israel is right, even if it means killing more Palestinians, and they continue to defend it and find excuses and justifications uh, like the whole idea of a self-defense. And the whole world bought into it. You know, the media bought into it, you know, the self-defense, the whole, you know, I can't understand how uh, not just the occupier, but the colonizer is defending itself from the colonized, you know, but the whole world bought into it. Uh, and they they promoted this and believed in this uh, side of the story, they, this, uh, this Zionist narrative. Uh, so it's multi, m multiple factors. And, and, you know, from the point of view of uh, where do we go from here, you mentioned that there's certain solutions. We have, you said we have to end the apartheid uh, rule. We have to find a solution. But what is a solution? Because, you know, like you said, we thought that maybe a ceasefire would be possible we thought that people are now starting to speak out a bit more than before compared to at the beginning. You're seeing more and more voices of people who weren't initially speaking out, but for whatever reason, they're speaking out more. Sometimes it's because their own country people are speaking out and they don't want to lose their votes or whatever their motive might be. Yet the actions are getting worse in terms of how Israel are attacking Gaza. All this pressure, seeming pressure, uh, which is building, it's doesn't seem to be having any effect on the actions of the Israelis who believe that, you know, I was speaking to Gideon Levy, uh, who is in Israel, and he said in their mind, they are doing God's work. They are God's people. And they don't see the images in the same way. It's not pumped in the same way in Israel uh, or it's not presented in the same way. So for them, they have a siege mentality. The more people are doing it, the more they feel they have the, the, the reason to stand up for their truth. So what's the solution in, in the face of this? No, I think the pressure must continue. I think we must continue and, and put pressure. I think uh, right now we have to in, you know, believe that the moral credibility and authority is found in the streets and not in the corridors of politicians and parliaments. Uh, and I hope that enough pressure will translate into change of policies. This is the path forward. Politicians are comfortable with the current status quo. They prove this. They prove this because they have been comfortable with Israel's occupying policies and building settlements in the West Bank uh, uh, and East Jerusalem. So politicians are comfortable. They're, they have managed the art of, uh, you know, they have uh, uh, perfected the art of managing the occupation and managing the conflict. While we kept insisting it's not sustainable and that it will explode in all of us' face, and it, sadly it happened in Gaza with catastrophic results. Uh, so we need to continue to put pressure and insist that the current status quo is not sustainable. And the way I look at it, 
uh, I don't see, you know, the options are simple. Uh, and the keys to the solution ultimately will have to go through the powerful nations, through Israel and those who enable Israel, because Israel have immunity from the international community. And this is what I mean. Um, the Zionists colonized our land. Uh, they came, they displaced us, but they couldn't get rid of us. They displaced many of us, but after 75 years of all of these policies, we're still in the land, almost the same number. So we either annihilate one another, one of us completely kills the other. I can't accept this, of course. We can't accept this. We can't even say it. We shouldn't say it. Uh, or, uh, you know, Israel continues with its current status quo, which is uh, containing Palestinians within communities, concentrating camps, uh, ghettos, if you wish, you know, putting us in these isolated communities. Gaza is one big example. Right now, the West Bank has turned into these. And then hoping that they continue to manage us and that this is sustainable. It's not sustainable. I think everyone realizes now that the system of apartheid that Israel has created is not sustainable. So where does that leave us? I think that leaves us with two options. And this is where the international community has to decide because they are the enablers of Israel. Uh, either, you know, go back to uh, being serious about dividing the land and creating two states, or just allow all Palestinians to, you know, dissolve within that one state and have equal rights. Uh, I, I don't think there are more options, to be honest, because the current status quo system of apartheid is not sustainable. No one believes we should get rid of one another. We either choose to live in one state as equals, or you go become serious about dividing the land and, and creating a two-state solution. Uh, the Palestinian leadership have been very inconsistent in saying the two-state solution is, uh, is, is the way forward. It's the international community that lacks the will and power uh, to not just pressure Israel, but to make sure Israel is sanctioned until it does its obligation and accepts the two-state solution. Just just to give a sense, because many people may not be familiar, but I saw some documentaries. So as you mentioned, right now, the attack is not it's nothing to do with Christian Muslim. It's to do with Palestinian. Yes, they are attacking Palestinians. So in a sense, uh, I did see some uh, um, footage, for example, um, when in I think it was in 2022, when Christians tried to attend the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and they were prevented from doing so. So why why was that the case that you, they were prevented uh, from from attending this church? The the conflict is not religious. Let's be clear, uh, and uh, we as Palestinian Christians uh, are suffering because we are Palestinians. Uh, there are some incidents in which Christians are targeted, especially in East Jerusalem. But by and large, the problem is that uh, uh, Israel insists on Jewish supremacy uh, uh, against everybody else. Uh, and uh, we uh, suffer because of the policies of Israel on the ground, because we are Palestinian. Now, the incident you mentioned uh, uh, is an example of uh, Israel's uh, attempt to uh, monopolize Jerusalem and make it uh, a Jewish city the Judaization of Jerusalem, while we continue to insist Jerusalem must be shared by two peoples and three religions, everybody should have the right equal uh, and uh, access of uh, to places of worship. Uh, to me, it's not just unacceptable, it's appalling. It's really appalling that, you know, I live in Bethlehem, it's 10 minutes away from Jerusalem. I can't go to Jerusalem. We're not allowed to go to Jerusalem. The Christian community that, you know, Growing up, Bethlehem was like a you know small extension of Jerusalem, two, two twin cities. Now we can't go, and even when we try, you know, in in holidays during Christmas or Easter, when we have when Israeli military gives permit to some Palestinians to go to Jerusalem, uh, and those Palestinian Christians who live in East Jerusalem, even when we try to go to the Church of the Holy Sacrament uh, in Septim Nur, the Holy Saturday, Holy Fire Saturday, uh, Israel tries to control the number of Palestinian worshippers who go there, 
Uh, Israel is an occupying power, by the way, in East Jerusalem. Let's not forget this. Uh, yet they uh, uh, try to control the number of worshippers. And I think behind all of that is they don't want to give... The, it's the same way, by the way, Amr, they try to control the number of Muslim worshippers in Ramadan uh, in Al-Aqsa Mosque. Because to them, they want to give the impression that Jerusalem is a Jewish city. And so uh, when you have this wide expression of Christian worshippers in uh, uh, Jerusalem uh, or Muslim worshippers in Jerusalem, I think this is what Israel does not uh, does not want. Uh, this is uh, something that has been going in East Jerusalem and the Old City in particular for a while now. Churches are attacked, clergy are attacked. Uh, the same way mosques and special Al-Aqsa Mosque, you know, they control and they put restrictions on the worshippers there. Uh, at its core, this is a matter of freedom of worship. You know, it's not even political. We have to uh, call things for uh, uh, for what they are. Uh, and of course, Israel can create any pretext it wants. They say it's security, it's uh, safety, and so on. But we know uh, what lies uh, behind this. And again, to be very clear, uh, this is a exclusivist mentality, policy, and the only way to fight it is with an alternative that is inclusive. In other words, I don't think Jerusalem should become exclusively Palestinian or exclusively Christian or Muslim. Uh, Jerusalem in its importance and symbolism must be something, you know, a city when it's it's only holy when it's shared. It's only holy when we respect one another. When human life becomes so, uh, you know, sacred, uh, because at the end of the day, this is the most sacred thing, human lives. Uh, and, and it should be uh, as such. So um, what many people, and going back to how you question, Palestinian Christians are not bystanders in this in this issue. And we're not, as some try to portray us, caught in between. Uh, we have been victims. We continue to be victims. We're on the Palestinian side because this is uh, our people. And uh, more importantly, as I said, uh, we suffer from occupation and apartheid just like all, all Palestinians. And we suffer from these exclusive ideologies and practices of Israel like all Palestinians do. There's something I often hear you say that if Jesus, peace be upon him, was born today, he would be born on... Because I think people don't realize there's a wall, right? There's a wall separating you and Israel. And there's something you often say about if Jesus was born today, I, that would be interesting to hear from you. And you say that he will be born on this side. <laughs> I say he will be born on this side of the wall because I look at the biblical story. And in the biblical story, Jesus was born uh, during the Roman Empire. And he was born among the occupied, not among the occupiers. Uh, and... Uh, he, uh, as a child, and the Holy Family suffered from and had to go and endure and survive a genocide of children or a massacre of children, the children of Bethlehem. Uh, I see in all of this a sign of God's solidarity with the oppressed, with the victims of violence, uh, with the occupied. So if Jesus 2,000 years ago, when he became man, we believe he's God who became man, uh, the incarnation, if Jesus was born among and he chose to be born among not the noble ones or the ones in power, but those who are marginalized and occupied and the victims of violence, then this is why we say if he's to be born today, he is born among the occupied, among the those who suffer. This is God's solidarity with the oppressed, uh, which is a very consistent message in our scripture, in the Bible. Uh, a God, and, and sometimes even Christians are not comfortable when I say this, a God who takes sides. Because, you know, we, we'd like to think uh, God is for all. Yes, God is for all. Uh, but when I say God takes sides, he does not take sides with a certain ethnicity or even a certain religion. He takes sides with the oppressed. He takes sides with the poor. Uh, and he lifts the lowly one. 
this is this is you know this is what jesus said <laughs> this is what uh, uh virgin mary sang about when uh, she was told about jesus that he lifts those with a humble spirit he sends the rich back you know he sent them away and uh, it's good news to the poor this is what i mean by a god who takes sides we like to make him a tribal god we like to make him a, a god of a certain group of people yes he's no uh, he, he, he God is the God of all, uh, and uh, you know when we say in in Christianity, Allah Mahabba, God is love. He's not love to Christians, you know. He's love to all people. Uh, but if God takes sides, He takes sides with the victims of oppression. Uh, and I think we should continue to preach this, the gospel as good news to the poor, and in some cases, it's bad news to the proud. Uh, this is what I mean by a God who takes sides. And this is why I always use the metaphor of a wall here in Bethlehem to say uh, Jesus was born on our side uh, of the wall. Yeah, I, just going towards the end, there's two more, three more questions. Just again, to give a perception uh, to show that it's not just a you know Muslim Christian thing. This is a Palestinian thing. I think there's also the famous example of the Christian Al Jazeera journalist, Shireen, uh, I think if I'm not pronouncing it correctly, Abu Akleh. Not, yes and actually she was a f f very brave journalist who was reporting she was a christian and actually her funeral procession was attacked yes and yes. and so this is another example of uh, the fact that it's you know it's a palestinian thing i mean can you describe this this is a very kind of uh, unbelievable thing to even read about or even see that a funeral procession is attacked yeah, it's it's so again, it's not a it's not a religious conflict, it's not a Jewish Muslim conflict for sure, as some try to portray it. And Palestinian Christians are very involved in the life of Palestinians, like all Palestinians, even in our plight for independence and liberation. Some do it do it through politics, some do it through journalism, uh, or through other means, through you know, uh uh advocacy and, and 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 other means palestinian christians have always been involved in the life of palestinian christians uh but you know uh, sharina abu Akhlas is, is an interesting uh you know she is almost like an icon now in palestine she's so much respected uh, she was so much even as a journalist uh for her bravery and for her honesty and uh Shireen holds an american passport and then you would think that america would you know, hold those who killed, assassinated a Palestinian journalist, an American journalist, accountable, but even then did it happen. And then when in front of the whole world, you know, uh, Palestinians insisted, and it's not just Palestinians and Palestinian uh, Christians, you know, because it was Muslims and Christians in that funeral, because Shireen was a symbol to all Palestinians. Uh, they insisted on, out of respect to her, to carry her coffin and to carry her uh, body throughout the state of Jerusalem. And the Israeli military, this is the last thing they wanted because they didn't want this big crowd of Palestinians with her coffin with a Palestinian flag in the middle of, uh, of Jerusalem, which ultimately happened, especially from the procession from the church to the tomb. I think you've, you've, seen, you've seen the images. Uh, and so when they tried to carry her coffin from the uh, hospital, which is a Christian hospital, again, uh, soldiers getting into the hospital. I mean, these are all things that are against the law. I mean, how is the world? And it was filmed for everyone to see. And then the people who are carrying her coffin were attacked. Uh, and there was, I mean, bless her memory and soul. There was so much symbolism in, in what happened because... You've had Palestinian Christians and Muslims carrying her coffin, being beaten, but refusing to fall. And I saw in that, you know, a symbol of the strength of, you know, Palestinians. We are beaten, but we don't fall. Uh, of our unity, the strength of our women uh, as, a, as, as a people, as Palestinian people, uh, and also uh, the important role of Palestinian Christians uh, for the whole uh, Palestinian community. And uh, for a few hours, uh, a Palestinian woman was able to liberate Jerusalem. 
because of the size of the funeral. And ultimately, the Israeli soldiers could not do anything uh, with the big number of Palestinians who marched from the church uh, to the graveyard. Um, so it is yet one more reminder that uh, Palestinians are united and that, you know, again, we need to, um, to ask whose interest is it uh, to continue to promote this as a religious conflict between Jews and Muslims? Uh, and I think it serves a certain agenda. Look at how this war uh, is talked about in some circles. Definitely the Israelis, but in many uh, other circles, has a, a battle between good and evil, the civilized and the uncivilized. Uh, so when I say racism and superiority, right now the big target is Arabs and Muslims. Uh, and uh, the mere fact of our existence as Palestinian Christians, let alone our positions, our activism, our involvement in the life of the Palestinian people, even in our plight for justice and liberation, uh, is the perfect answer to these, to these claims. I think it's very, very dangerous, and we should uh, be very vocal and brave to, to stand against uh, any attempt to put religions in conflict. Dr. Munter, I want to ask one thing which is very important because, you know, we speak out about, about all the oppression, but as Muslims, we're also told in the Quranic verse that if there's any attack on any place of worship, whether it's a church, a temple, a synagogue, then as Muslims, where uh, uh, we should actually defend the right of freedom of religion or freedom of worship. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was an attack on a Greek Orthodox church, church I believe, uh, during this conflict. There's a lot of debate about this. There's a lot of furor, of course. And uh, we saw lots of interviews with the, the priest or the pastor there. There was a lot of back and forth about whose fault it was. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, what's bad was that the church was bombed. But how do you see this? Because obviously, initially, they said that the Israelis bombed this, but then they put the blame on someone else. Um, could you shed some light on this as well? Uh Israel did not shift the blame when it comes to the bombing of the Orthodox Church. The only thing they said is we bombed the building next to it and it collapsed. Uh, but of course they knew that it will damage the, the church building that collapsed and it actually killed 18 Palestinian uh, uh, Christians, including nine children. Um, the churches have been attacked, mosques have been attacked, hospitals have been attacked, schools have been attacked. Uh, I don't know what's there to to debate and try to defend and and uh, the only thing that Israel claimed they did not do is the attack on in the beginning of the war of the uh, Baptist Anglican Hospital Al Ahli Hospital, but then they've attacked other hospitals. So you know, uh, it's not as if Israel does not attack uh, does not attack hospitals. Sadly, this war has the the, the tragedy, and I look at it. To begin with, to be honest, from a human level, because no no place is a safe place right now. You would think that the people of Gaza, if they take refuge in a church, that they will be safe, but they were not. Uh, this is the sad thing that they will, you know, they can hide in a mosque. It's not, and everything is now described as human shields and so on. Uh, it's it's really uh, this is the tragedy: is that people have no safe place right now uh, in Gaza. Dr. Munter, have you been able to visit any of these areas in the last six months, or you're not able to no, visit? We're not, we're not, you know, even Cannot before visit. the war, we're not allowed to go to Gaza. Mm. Even before mm. the war, uh, we're not allowed to go to Gaza. The majority of Palestinians who live in Bethlehem cannot go to Jerusalem. When you speak to people, go. when you speak to people you know in those directly affected areas, what are they telling you today? I mean, of course, we hear on the news, but when you speak directly to the people, we've also been doing some interviews with people, but when you speak to them, what are they telling you on the ground right now? The, the, the thing that we're hearing right now from people we talk to is that uh, it's a new level uh, in this genocide because now they're talking about actual starvation and dying from diseases or from just simply getting sick. They talk about lack of food and uh, lack of clean water. This has always been the case, but now it's really a serious, serious problem. Um, you know, at the beginning, it was shoot, it was bombing that they were afraid of. Then it became shooting because two women died in the Catholic Church. Uh, they were shot dead. 
in the middle of the you know the church campus and right now you know we've heard of many palestinians talk about the christian community that we're in direct contact with who died uh because they became sick and uh there was no way to go to a hospital or to find medication and uh last conversations i had with friends that they say we don't have food uh, we don't have you know we only eat one piece of bread a day with little cheese sometimes dates i mean they don't have uh they're lacking the basic uh requirements for for life so dr munter my final question might seem completely unrelated to what we've been saying but going back to the christian evangelical kind of side and uh, it relates to the coming of Jesus and it relates to the, you know, how they believe of the Armageddon and the rapture and et cetera, et cetera. I asked this to my Jewish friends on the Notori Carta and I always ask this question about um, what your concept is of the second coming. Uh, what is the, your belief of the second coming of Jesus, peace be upon him? Because there's so many views. As I'm interested to know what's your view on the second coming of Jesus because this is also an important fa- point. Although it is not a religious conflict, there's many... Uh, so-called Jewish people who have certain views about the coming of uh, 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 the first Messiah. Then there's the views of tens of millions, they they claim, of Christian Zionists or evangelicals who have certain views about why they support Israel and the second coming of Jesus. So what is your view of the second coming of Jesus according to the Bible, the Injil, etc.? Yeah. So yes, I mean, there are some who believe that it's a requirement for the coming of Jesus that Jews are gathered in Palestine. Uh, I don't believe so, but this is um, one reason behind why many evangelicals support the creation of Israel. It's as if they want to uh, give a helping hand to God as if so that Jesus comes sooner than later. Uh, I, I found it, you know, not just troubling, but completely misguided way of thinking. God doesn't need uh, our help in this, God actually asks our help in, in a different matter that I'll explain now. Um, Jesus is coming. This is a tenant of the Christian faith. and He's coming to put our world, uh, to make our world right, to put an end to all injustice, to all death, to all suffering, and bring a new reality to our world. Uh, the, the concept of restoration, restoring creation, not a certain people, but everybody. Uh, bringing good Um, and the most important thing about the coming the second coming of Jesus when you look at Jesus's own teaching about the second coming uh, is that we should be ready we should be prepared and the way we are prepared is by being active by being involved by uh, being uh, good Christians if you wish and what does that mean it means actually uh, doing good uh, in our world and so Let me uh, highlight one of the most important teachings about Jesus, about the second coming, because he said uh, during the second coming, there will be people on the right and people on the left. And uh, God will say to those on the right, come to me. And those on the left, I don't know you. And the ones on the right will say, why should, why are we accepted? He said, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me water. I was naked, you gave me clothes. Uh, I was a stranger, you gave me a home, I was a prisoner and you visited me. And they say, when did we do these things? And he said, well, whoever done these things to the least of you, he has done these things to me. Uh, Imagine, Amir, if this is the teaching we all emphasize when it comes to the judgment day, that we will be judged by God based on how we uh, relate and treat the vulnerable among us, on how much good we do in our world. Imagine if people of different faiths compete among themselves as to who does this more, feeding the poor, uh, providing shelter to the refugee, uh, uh, you know, helping those who are suffering from oppression, bringing justice. Uh, this is what should we, we should focus on when it comes to the second coming and being ready. And in fact, Jesus reminds us Whoever has done these things, you have done them to me. Uh, I mean, what honor uh, Jesus gives to the marginalized by telling people, you should see me in every victim of marginalization and uh, and oppression. So yes, I believe Jesus is coming, but what's more important is, are we ready? And how do we get ready? Uh, We get ready by doing precisely that. Uh, And I hope we all get involved uh, in this.
No, Dr. Munter, it's been amazing discussing with you. And as I said, it seems strange to say this. I loved the podcast discussion, but I also loved our discussion 20 minutes before the podcast, which was not recorded. And we exchanged our views and you asked about the Ahmadiyya community. And I mentioned about our view of the second coming, which is we believe it's a metaphorical second coming of Jesus. Most Muslims believe he'll come physically, but we believe he died naturally and he has come again. But that's a case for another episode. But um, I, I'm so uh, delighted that you made time to join us today and give a very important voice, which we hadn't represented, which was the Christian voice, and particularly from Bethlehem, which is said to be the birthplace of Jesus, peace be upon him, and as a Palestinian, because often you're speaking as a Palestinian as well, of course, and you have a joint struggle uh, there. It's a very dire situation. Many people are suffering. We sometimes, uh, in our everyday lives here in the West, we can easily forget that. And that's why it's very important to keep having voices from Palestine to remind us of this suffering, of the situation, so we can pray for them, so we can help them as well. Um, Dr. Munter, what kind of message of hope do you leave our, you know, if you had one message to to end with for the viewers, for people listening, what message of hope or message of any type do you, do you end with? Um. Although it's very, very difficult to find and talk about hope in these very, very dark days, I am uh, thankful that this war has brought so many of us from different parts of the world together uh, in search of a common humanity and in search for, for justice. I have hope in God. I believe in, in a good and just God. And I believe that ultimately goodness will prevail. Uh, in Christianity, the belief in the resurrection is, is, is very foundational, that Jesus was risen after being crucified. And in that, there is a message that ultimately life overcomes death, ultimately justice overcomes tyranny. And this hope becomes our mandate. So what hope uh, do we have when people ask me, uh, you know, hope is... Uh, what we create in our world, when we work together to make our world a better place. I think God has done his part. He has shown us the way. Uh, Jesus has shown us the way. Uh, and I think ultimately it has to do with, with us. If we believe in a good and just God, then let's get busy uh, doing the work of God. Uh, it sounds dark. It sounds difficult. But uh, we cannot give in. We cannot give up. We cannot stop. And especially, especially in times uh, like this, I think uh, when people look back at this dark period, one of the question they will ask is, where were the good people? Uh, I would say, where was the church? You know, where was the believers in God from different traditions who don't accept the killing and, and the way of tyranny and death and, and violence? This is the question we should ask, and I hope that we can work from different traditions to uh, uh, bring justice into our world. Dr. Munter, um, I would like to also say if you ever come to England again, I would love to host you and show you more of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. We have the largest mosque here in Western Europe and the first mosque in London ever built. And uh, so I would love if you ever have any time to come and join us as well. It will be my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation, of course. Of course. Uh, Dr. Munter Ishaq, uh, it's, uh, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so much for giving us this insight. And, and until next time, peace be upon you. Thank you. Alaikum assalam. Okay. Well, Make sure to like, comment below and subscribe to our YouTube channel and other channels for the latest content.